Thank you so much for having me, Kirsty. I am. Um, Walking is something that's been part of my own research practice and also one of the ways in which I've been trying to understand um, my results. So I got very excited when I saw this session and I'm very, very grateful to um, be able to present to you today. Um, uh, my name's Coralie Atchison. I'm a PhD researcher at the Ironbridge International Institute for Cultural Heritage. Just checking, there's actually images on the screen behind me. Um, <laughs> and um, I'm at the University of Birmingham and I'm looking at how world heritage values are communicated to tourists uh, looking at Ironbridge Gorge, which is an industrial world heritage site in Shropshire. Um, this is a combination of some reflections, uh, some ethnographic uh, data and uh, research and ideas. I've um, got some new ideas, so um, I would be very grateful of any reflections that you have, because some of this is only about a week old in terms of my thinking. Um, trying to frame some of my research in terms of ideas about intimacy and distance which are formed through um, both different walking practices um, but also the way in which sites and their management structure the ways in which um, visitors to sites are able to encounter sites. And um, I was reflecting a little on, on what Kirsty was talking about and, uh, and uh, people earlier and um, thinking if, if encounters with modern landscapes are um, is how experiences are mediated. It's worth reflecting on places where there is a direct intention to communicate archaeology in these landscapes, in these modern landscapes, um, and whether or not there is, they're actually very effective. So <laughs> we'll see. Uh, so a little reflection on seasonality, which I know has been mentioned. When I first started my research, I started in October, uh, in terms of my field work and um, sort of pressed on towards midwinter and um, I walked a lot of the valley that was how I, I came to sort of get my own um, grounding in it as a place it's a six mile stretch of river gorge with two tributary valleys and I was looking at tourism so I had a bit of a lead in um, where I was spending a lot of time talking to people who worked in the gorge and potentially I was speaking to them quite early in the morning and late in the afternoon and I often had quite long stretches of time between my interviews and there were no tourists to attempt to interview at that point. Um, and so I, I sort of was able to see all these different landscapes in different weather and uh, how mist and uh, bright sunlight and different um, foliage and plants really begin to affect how you feel in these landscapes. And I began to feel that I, I sort of knew it. That was how my sense of it. And then, of course, the tourists began to show up in the... Uh, spring and summer and the site is really transformed it becomes much more busy and vibrant and uh, places which are completely quiet become really busy there's a lot more noise and, and energy and um, I realized that that really affects um, both the experience of it as somebody who's working there or living there presumably as well um, and also of course the experience of the tourist is not necessarily what my experience as solitary walker in winter is so I had to start to re reflect and change my ideas about it as a place. So before going further, <laughs> I thought I'd uh, laden you uh, with some theory. <laughs> of course, from the great theorist Michael Rosen, um, <laughs> with his, uh, <laughs> we're going on a bear hunt. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I can't claim all the credit for this. Um, uh, Tim Ingold writes about, um, we're going on a bear hunt. And um, he talks about how uh, it's a really beautiful example of how we get a really vivid experience and perception of place by walking through it. It's not purely a visual experience, as, as we know and we've spoken about earlier, um, but it's something that is really it's embodied and it's something that we, um, we gain knowledge through the world by squelching through the mud and swishing through the long grass. And uh, all of these kind of experience, the visual, the sensory, sound, all kind of come together to give us this knowledge of place. Um, I'm also drawing on a very large body of theory uh, from tourism studies. Uh, so I'm not just looking at walkers, but also um, tourists and tourism theory. Um, in tourism, visu the visual is incredibly important. I think we all know about sightseeing, for example, is the kind of classic tourist approach. But of course, that is also an embodied form of looking. There's a lot of very um, significant work by John Uri about the tourist gaze and this idea that um, tourism, while it may be visually structured, is about framing the world in which we look at and how we understand it and engage with it. Through looking is something that's got a much bigger kind of socio structure around it. 
and um, obviously very Foucauldian, which is appropriate at a theory conference. Um, so looking at the world through tourism <coughs> is something that's embodied. It is often through walking. There are obviously other forms of mobility, um, bike riders and, and all of that. And um, as we walk and we look, uh, we come to know the places that we visit, or do we? So this is where we get to some fun bits, because it is Wednesday afternoon, and I'm hoping you're not all too tired. <laughs> I wanted to introduce you to two particular walks around the two principal monuments in the World Heritage Site. Um, these, when I say they are the two principal monuments, that's to do with the designation. So it's a World Heritage Site, and it's designated because of the Iron Bridge, which is the world's first Iron Bridge, and um, the Old Furnace, which is really important in the development of iron uh, metallurgy. And these are the things which justify it as having um, evidence of humanity's outstanding creative genius, if you're into the UNESCO language. Um, but actually, in terms of encounter, one of them is a crumbling pile of bricks ensconced in a pyramid structure, and the other is a relatively de delicate metal footbridge over the river. Um, so I wanted to have a look at how people walked around them, and I couldn't take you all so I decided to do a kind of virtual form of this. So I'm going to do one that I tried on Twitter. I got people to be my puppet masters and tell me where to walk. And I'll storify this all for you later. And um, I've also got one for you to try in a moment. So I started at the bridge and uh, I realised very rapidly that the current conservation work was blocking off one of my potential routes. Uh, but so I had two, two ways that I could walk. I could go through the tunnel or I could go around the side. And... Um, I got told, with a reference to the bear hunt, that I had to go through it, so I went through the tunnel. <laughs> and I was then faced with three, op uh, three options, so I could go up the stairs, um, I could go onto the sort of viewing platform area, or I could go down to the river. Um, I got told to go down and battle the troll, well, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> uh, but I got down there, and more conservation work meant that I couldn't actually go under the bridge, as I might have uh, previously done. Um, so I, I was told to go up. Huge thanks, by the way, I don't think any of them are in the room, but thank you to all the people who volunteered their um, puppeteering <laughs> through Twitter. Um, it was actually um, Remembrance uh, Day, it was the 11th of November, and um, it was around, it was mid-morning, and I sort of was aware that at 11 o'clock there was going to be a service at the War Memorial. I hadn't realised that there'd be so many people gathering from about 10.15 uh, when I was doing the walk, and so I, I realised I was going to have to kind of shortcut around them and... Uh, Leave, leave them in peace, obviously. Um, so I, I dashed around them, and then um, I said, shall I go to the viewing platform, uh, which is back towards the area where I'd originally started, or cross the bridge? So I got told to go to the viewing platform, and then eventually uh, cross to the bridge. And this is where it got to the point where there was a little bit of too much knowledge in the situation, because tourists almost always stop at this gate, and they never go any further. But I said, is there anywhere else I should go? And uh, somebody quite wisely asked me, was there anywhere else to go? And I said, well, there are these steps. <laughs> um, and so we went down the steps, and you get a completely different view of the bridge from underneath the um, other side. But there's no signs that you can go down there, so different part of knowledge and walking there. So it's now your turn. <laughs> so this is the old furnace. So you need to get over towards that pyramid structure. And at this point, uh, you've got to choose your own adventure, effectively. You can go uh, along the path. Sorry, I'm pointing at this. This is a bit I can see. You've got to go along the path, or you can go over the grass. What, does, what do you want to do? Over the grass. 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 <laughs> I've tried to predict, but this could get very complicated. Through the river. HTML, and then you can do it on oh. the PowerPoint. I'm okay, sure you to do that. that sounds awesome. terrifying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we've got across the grass, so I got you right on the first one. Um, <laughs> I thought you'd be a little bit anarchical. Tourists do go along the path more predictably. <laughs> and so we can, now, we can see into Abraham Darby's furnace, which is just behind the glass in the pyramid. And so we now have a choice between walking along one side of the front of the pyramid and uh, the other. So would you like to go towards the viaduct or round the other corner, which you can't see from the position that you're currently in? Where you can't see. Where you can't see. Ah, good. <laughs> there are, the other options are in here. <laughs> so uh, we've now got a rather strange area of gravel with a sign, which you may opt to, to read or not. Um, and uh, really, the question is, you can give up now, or you can go into the pyramid. Would you like to go in? Yes. 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 OK. <laughs> right. Now, would you like to go through the tunnel or around to the bit that you've seen through the glass? Tunnel. 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 
Nope. Hang on. <laughs> it's actually that you're rejoining one of the other options at this stage. <laughs> so now you can go back through the tunnel. <laughs> or you can go up the steps. Steps. Nope. Nope. Stop that. <laughs> I knew this was a bad idea. You won! <laughs> there was an option where you didn't get up the steps and uh, you missed it entirely. Um, but I have decided, arbitrarily, uh, not actually arbitrarily, I'll explain this in a minute, decided that if you could get up the steps and look into the top of the blast furnace, uh, you had won the game of walking around the furnace. That was just to show you there are some other options on there. <laughs> right, so how are we doing for time? You're very good. Brilliant. Got through that a lot quicker than I expected. <laughs> that was my big moment of... Um, how, how long will this actually take? <laughs> Thank you for playing along. So what does this all mean? <laughs> At both the Iron Bridge and the Old Furnace, tourist performances are really centred around walking, um, which is obviously an issue in terms of the accessibility of the landscape, um, particularly when talking about walking up what is actually quite a steep slope over the bridge, um, <coughs> and... Um, Essentially, over quite muddy ground or up steps, it, it, it's not a, an overly accessible landscape. Um, however, through a sort of nearly a year of, of sort of ethnographic work, interviewing people and um, doing a lot of observation and participant observation, and I sort of identified that at these two particular places, there is quite different practices of walking, um, and I think they um, have the potential to create quite different arenas for knowledge production. Um, this can be broadly defined as the difference between walking around and walking over, uh, which is both literal and, and metaphorical. For me, this is the difference between something which is intimate um, and something where distance is actually enforced through the structures of the site. So at the Iron Bridge, you can walk around it, as we saw in my uh, attempt to get people, my archaeologist friends to guide me around it. They didn't really want me to go across the bridge because... Um, and say quite anarchical in this discipline, <laughs> um, but uh, for tourists, walking across the bridge is is incredibly significant. Um, I spent a lot of time watching what people do there, and, and the thing that stood out the most is that people walk across the bridge only to turn around and walk back across it. It is not something that is done for the functional reason of actually crossing the bridge, but to be on the bridge, and because... I think there's something very, you know, it seems like the common sense thing to do when visiting a bridge is to walk across it and see what the view is from the bridge. Um, this was so universal that when I started doing my interviews with tourists on the bridge, the place I found that was best to um, intercept tourists and figure out that they were actually tourists was to see, stand at one end, to see where people were reaching it and turning around. And in that moment where they were both milling a little and also identifying to me that they really were tourists, um, I could sort of grab them and say, oh, can I ask you some questions? <laughs> um, but also when I spoke to people, um, people told me, you know, one of them jokingly said, we need to walk across it really slowly. We have to savour the experience, you know? So there was a kind of self-awareness that walking across the bridge was both the really important aspect of the visit, but also that there was something slightly odd about it. So you've crossed the bridge just to return back the other way. Um, on the screen, I have um, a quote from Bill Bryson, who visited Ironbridge as part of his um, most recent uh, book about um, Britain. And he identifies another really central aspect. It's not just walking, but it's walking and looking. Um, he talks about walking around it to get different, as many views as possible. And um, that was certainly something that uh, one of the museum staff I spoke to identified. He said, people just walk on it, do a little dance, take a selfie and leave. And then they go across the river, uh, they go across uh, the road and sit there, get a coffee and just look at it. Um, so when I was trying to pick apart, you know, which bit is significant? Is it <coughs> being on the bridge? Is it looking at the bridge? And, and what are people doing in these particular moments? Um, and the interesting thing that's hinted at in, the, in this quote is that they take a selfie on the bridge and they do their little dance. When I did a big analysis of Instagram, which I won't go on to, <laughs> there's a whole other paper on that, um, people seem to take pictures of the bridge when they're not on it, and they take pictures of themselves on the bridge. And combined with my interviews and talking to people, the place where people seem to be having the greatest connection with the Iron Bridge as a structure is when they're standing on it. And um, that's where they're taking their family photos, and they're taking photographs of themselves and their dogs. 
and it's a place where they're lingering and they're spending time. There's a lot of, um, you can see people sort of lean on it and just kind of look at the river and, and hang out. Um, and crucially, um, in terms of maybe doing heritage management better, people take a selfie and then they leave because there is no interpretation on the bridge. There's no real opportunity to interact with them in that space and tell stories. So I'll move on um, in contrast with the furnace, which is a place where people walk around rather than walk over. So um, as we saw, the paths encourage you to walk down one side of it. You can obviously bypass that and walk across the grass, uh, but then you encounter this massive structure and you have to sort of slowly spiral around it and um, in kind of closer confines. Um, and then you leave again, so it's not a great <laughs> structure. But as you slowly spirally, spiral in, you get the opportunity to read lots of very detailed signs. Um, and um, there's, a, there's over 3,000 words of interpretation on these signs. There's a lot. And it has a very high reading age. Um, so what that then was not particularly surprising when I realised that while people often stand and look at signs, when I interviewed them, after I'd watched them stand and look at the signs, most of them didn't know what they were looking at and uh, told me, oh yeah, we didn't, didn't really look at them, we just sort of, you act out the <laughs> behaviour of the tourist and, and perform tourism and you, you stand and look intelligently at the sign but actually don't really read it, um, which is, is sad because they are quite good but they are very technical. So some quotes from visitors to the furnace, we just generally walked around it, had a glimpse of the signs, it's great to see these places in real life. You get an impression of what it was like for people in the past. It's so well preserved. It's an absolute pleasure to walk around it all. I'm not entirely sure what perception of the people in the past you can get from walking around an entirely silent blast furnace, so, you know, but maybe these people had much greater inter imagination than I have. So, <clears throat> on reflection, the slow meandering of visitors around the furnace is often associated with a lack of deeper engagement. Lots of people said, oh, it's, it's very nice you know, but didn't really know what it was or why it was important. Um, and um, what's interesting is the people who really did seem to find something about it often commented on the steps that I showed you, the bit where I told you that you had won. Um, people told me that that was their favourite bit. They said, we really liked that you could get closer. Um, when we looked inside it, that was when we really realised what it was. It was much bigger inside than we expected, or much smaller. <laughs> it depends where people are coming from. Um, and I think that while not exactly being analogous to crossing a bridge, climbing to the top of the charging ramp of a blast furnace, because that's what you're, you're looking at there, and looking down into its crucible is about as intimate as you can get with the blast furnace. Um, and it's intriguing that this, despite the fact that a lot of the people I was talking to were not entirely sure what this structure was or why it was important, that that was the moment that they felt that they had connected with it. And so that's maybe, if we're draw drawing this further, maybe that's the point that we should be aiming the storytelling and the, the interpretation. So as a final reflection, in this uh, paper I've tried to um, examine how contrasting walking practices at both the Old Furnace and the Iron Bridge relate to visitor experiences of them. And so I just want to <coughs> reflect on walking and storytelling, which I promised in the abstract. <laughs> um, so walking is one of the most popular tourist pursuits in the gorge. Um, one of the staff members at uh, the Visitor Information Centre told me walking is top, top, top. She's absolutely adamant. Walking generally is an important tourist practice. Uh, it's um, lots of people in Britain, there's research by Visit England that says that people are trying to get out of the fast lane when they go on holiday. Um, and gentle countryside walking is one of the things that people identify as what they're looking to, to do. Often we're not talking about significant distances walking, we're talking two or three miles followed by a pub lunch. You know, it's, it's that sort of walking that a lot of people are looking for. Um, and that's something that's very readily available in Ironbridge. But if we want to assist visitors in finding out more about the places that they're visiting, then we need to think about how these places structure the ways that they're walking. The local destination marketing organisation in Ironbridge told me that many people walk around the gorge, see, around again, um, but they have no idea where they are and what it is. Knowledge and walking are not inherently linked, although I think it's a really important way in which we can develop knowledge. Uh, so where is that moment where the knowledge can be created? Rebecca Solnit uh, writes that walking can most of the time be purely practical, but can be infused with meaning. And she uses the examples of the Stations of the Cross, 
the labyrinth and the maze to show that when accompanied by stories, walking can become an intensely significant experience. These places, uh, she says, offer up stories we can walk into to inhabit bodily, stories we trace with our feet as well as our eyes. By crossing the bridge, it's not too difficult to encourage visitors to think about the site as a bridge, but at the Old Furnace, we may need a little bit more help. <laughs> um, by thinking about these places as storyscapes, maybe we have a better opportunity to infuse their walked or, and lived experience by visitors with meaning. Um, and when we allow visitors to move beyond walking around with all the implied distance that this involves and invite them into walking over, not necessarily literally, um, I think there's a real potential for much greater intimacy and thus better communication. Thank you very much.